Your News Minority Political Party's Presidential Candidates Debate. We are live tonight on Joy News Channel on the Multi TV. We are also live on Joy 99.7 FM. We are live tonight also on Love FM in Kumasi, my Joy Online dot com. Uh, many social media platforms. Remember, hashtag election headquarters. We are live tonight also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. My name is Evans Mensah. And I am MFA Paul. We'll start tonight with brief opening remarks from the Senior Vice President of Imani Africa, Kofi Bento. It's always useful to hear the people who want to run your life and your affairs. And it's not just for the fun of it. It's a very simple ceremony or function, but it's also very important. For the simple reason that very good ideas sometimes come from unlikely places. So we want to hear every idea, and then we can make up our minds. Indeed, if you know the story of Yayi Boni, you will remember that an independent candidate who was not known through Inter interactions like this was able to make an impact and win an election. So we hope that this will become more of a tradition in this country where even those who are in power will submit themselves to processes like these and give us the benefit of their ideas for what they want to do in the next four years, for instance. I hope that time will come and we will not have a situation where um, people just choose not to debate or choose not to tell us what they have for us in the next four years. We are happy with our partners, um, Joy FM, and we will continue to engage with them across this election period and try and bring you the best analysis and the best viewpoints that we can bring to bear just to improve the quality of the discourse over this period. It is our country. We have to make the best decisions we can make because the consequences will be visited on us first. So thank you very much for coming, and we hope for a very good night. And thank you for all the um, parties here represented. We wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kofi Bento. We will now go through the rules for tonight's debate. The Imani Joy News presidential debate will span a total length of two hours, 30 minutes. The questions will be based on key thematic areas, the economy, governance, the social sector, infrastructure, including technology and innovation, education and human capital development. At the end of each round of questions, the moderators may pause to allow for rebuttals, reactions or follow-ups. Each candidate will have one minute to make an opening statement and another minute for closing statements. The allotted time to answer a substantive question is 60 seconds, while 30 seconds is allowed for the rebuttals or reactions. A ring from a bell will indicate when a candidate has exhausted the time due. The order of arrangement of candidates is based strictly on the transparent balloting process participated by the candidates themselves. Candidates are expected to show respect to the opponents, the moderators, and the audience. Audience are expected to remain silent during the debate. Audience are specifically discouraged from applause and jeers. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now introduce the candidates. And for the last time, the only time that we'll get to clap and cheer Let's welcome the presidential candidates in this particular order. To podium one, we have the Progressive People's Party's presidential candidate, Bridget Jogbenuku. To podium two, we have the PNC's presidential candidate, that's the People's National Convention, Peter Apasera. Then to podium three, we have the All People's Convention's presidential candidate, Hassan Ayariga. 
To podium four, we have the Convention People's Party's presidential candidate, Ivo Green Street. Then to podium five, we have the LPG's presidential candidate, Kofi Atalu. For the last time, let's hear it for the presidential candidates, all the various political parties. You can do it better. So once again, the Progressive People's Party's presidential candidate, Bridget Jogbenuku, the PNC's presidential candidate, David Apasera, to podium three, APC's presidential candidate, Hassan Nayarega, Ivo Green Street, podium four for the Convention's People's Party, and Kofi Akpalu for the LPG. We zoom straight into the questions. We will start tonight on law and order. Tonight, Ghana is experiencing a disturbing trend of growing insecurity, at least as a sense that you get from the public of that. Violent crimes, electoral violence, and now secessionist movement. In fact, the PPP's candidate. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Sure. Thank you. I'll finish my question. In fact, the PPP's candidate. Madam Jubanuku, you suspended your campaign in the Volta region due to the secessionist attacks. A member of parliament has been brutally murdered. We know that. Mr. Ivor Green Street has sounded all up in his own words, quote, growing insecurity, inadequate police intelligence, end quote. And long before we got here, there has been several political attempts by the NDC and the MPP, and indeed a law has recently been passed to allow these crimes, particularly vigilantism. What do each of you think the law missed, and what clear workable strategies would you adopt to prevent further deterioration of law and order? The specific question will come. I'll mention your name, and then you take it. But I will start with Madame Jobanuku on your one minute to lay your own foundation. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you all for coming to listen to us. And good evening to the viewers on uh, all the media. As I've been introduced, my name is Bridget Jogbenuku, and I'm the flag bearer for the Progressive People's Party, running for president of the Republic of Ghana offering Ghanaians a new kind of leadership, a new kind of leadership that gives you good governance, a new kind of leadership that gives you human capital development, a new kind of leadership for economic empowerment and food security, and a new kind of uh, leadership for infrastructural development. When I speak of economic empowerment especially, I'm talking about jobs for the youth, and for the people of Ghana. This is what a PPP-led government with me as president is offering Ghanaians from 2020 to 2024. Thank you very much. David Abbasara. Good evening to you, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful for this opportunity to introduce myself. I'm Honorable David Abbasara. I hail from Zuarungu in the Bolkatanga East District. I have been an elected member three times, a district assembly elected member, two times elected member of parliament, one time member of ECOWAS parliament, and now I'm leading the People's National Convention to compose the next government for the Republic of Ghana. Uh, our government and uh, the People's National Convention. The, the thing of lack of education for all, the thing of inaccessibility to medical care, lack, want, poverty, and deprivation will be a thing of the past. Our government shall be a government for the people. Thank you. Hassan Ayariga. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hassan Ayariga, founder and leader of the All People's Congress. I'm a family man, 
married to Anita Ayariga with five children. I'm a businessman, philanthropist, and a politician. I hail from Boku. I'm a Kusasi. I'm 48 years old. I believe Ghana is in crisis, leadership crisis. The APC is founded based on an all-inclusive governance concept. And we believe that Ghana is not struggling and suffering because of just the leadership of NDC and MPP, but the good people out there who are quiet and silent. So I'm calling on everybody out there to join the wagon of the APC so that we can transform Ghana and restore hope that the Ghanaian people should not live in poverty because of lack of leadership, but we have a train that is going to transform our country and restore hope. Thank you very much. Mr. Green Street. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ivor Kovana Green Street. I'm happy to be here. Grateful to Multimedia and Imani for organizing this event. We believe that we need to restore trust and faith in the government of Ghana. We believe that it is possible for Ghanaians, wherever they may be spread over this, our beloved land, to achieve their dreams and also to lay a foundation for successive generations to also achieve their dreams. We believe with hard work, with faith, with determination, with the right ideas, with the right leadership, it is possible to achieve the goal for this country and our destiny as a people and make this nation the place we want it to be. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Mr. Apalu. The next president of Ghana, Kofi Apalu. And in government, I'm going to put money directly into people's pocket by introducing unemployment benefits and child benefits. I'm also going to set up a $10 billion job fund that will help the young men and women who have come out from our universities and polytechnics to borrow money to start their own businesses. We are also going to make sure we build affordable rental accommodation to enable those who are living in the slums to have a very good place to call home. We are going to support our families. We are going to support every young man out there who want to make it no matter the trade that you want to enter. LPG government will put food on your table. We will make sure if you want to become an athlete, we will support you. If you want to learn any trade, we will support you. That is more reason why I'm here this evening to ask for your vote. Thank you. Now to the most topical issue today. As I indicated, law and order. Let me start with you, Mr. Passera, on the back of the bargain I laid at the beginning. You said two days ago that you would deploy helicopters to chase armed robbers. What else would you do to prevent further escalation of violent crimes? Thank you. Well, the, the, the essential thing is that the government has done all that they, have, they could do with the, the current security system. And we want to go further than that. We want to put in place a paramilitary organization that will be a rapid striking force to prevent highway armed robbery and other violent crimes. And these, this organization will be stationed in all regions and empowered with helicopter gunships that will rapidly move into the air to defend people who are arrested on the highway. It will no longer be a system where police will move with sirens. And we are going to empower them, train them high skill, and give them the needed, the needed and the latest weaponry. We shall empower them with bulletproof vehicles, bulletproof weapons. Hassan Ayariga, what's your plan to fix the security concerns? First of all, we need to look at the issue of security from the security themselves. You realize that most of our security agencies are coming from political parties, vigilante groups. And any time a political party is in power, they push every food soldiers of them to be part of the security. Now, what we need to do is to give a, an academic requirement 
for people going into the security office, a minimum requirement that one must have in order to become a security officer. Two, we also need to know that to train the security people, we need to train them out of systems that has a database so that the police will have a database to be able to track down everybody in this country, a database that shows information about every Ghanaian, a database that has details of every Ghanaian. For instance, we also need to have a very unique forensic unit so that when crime is done, it is very easy to identify those people who are involved in crime. Two fingerprints, two blood group. Thank you. Mr. Ivor Green Street, your plan? It is clear the institutions that are mandated to carry out the activities for the state with respect to security are in existence already. But they are underfunded, they are under-equipped, and in many instances, they lack the required direction and strategy to carry out the necessary formula to tackle the specific events that they may be dealing with at any point in time. It is very, very important, therefore, to give them further investment, further training, further capabilities in order for them to carry out their mandate. We believe that this is critical, especially at this point in time, as we move to a greater level of tension as we approach the December 2020 elections. None of this can be done without serious intelligence work and cross-sharing of intelligence data via all the agencies spread around the country. Mm. Mr. Paluso, what's your plan? Please, the question. The question is, what else will you do to prevent further escalation of violent crimes in the wake of the concerns around security we've heard from the people? Okay, thank you. Uh, our plan is simple, because the root cause needs to be tackled. And what is the root cause? Poverty, unemployment. So if you are able to get our people jobs to do, all these crimes will, uh, will go down. So in our government, we will make sure our young men and women have gotten the right kind of job and they are supported to do whatever they have to do to have a meaningful life. Because this, uh, all these violent crimes that you are seeing around, it's only those who are unemployed those from the poor back, uh, backgrounds are uh, mostly used in this direction. So as a party in government, we are going to make sure we provide them unemployment uh, benefit, those who are not working, those uh, that we can offer them good jobs, we will do that. And that will minimize crime in this country. Madam Jokunuku, it's your turn to take up that same question about security and what your plan is to fix it. Oh. I'd like to say, and thank you very much, I'd like to say, um, I grew up with a background of security. I grew up in the barracks. And gone are the days when um, the people who were in the security services got there by dint of hard work and meritocracy. The security services must be allowed to work by themselves and not have interference from political parties or political leadership, first of all. That will ensure that when they have to effect their authority, they will be respected and uh, they will be able to put the fear of God, if you like, in people who are seen as criminals. Now, the law that you, you spoke about must be enforced. Passing a law without enforcement does not ensure that the crimes are stopped. And therefore, um, to, to enforce the, the law, you need, Finish. you need the security services to be fully equipped enough to be able to apprehend some of these criminals okay. and enforce the, uh, enforce the law. Uh, um, this is a follow-up, so 30 um, seconds to respond to this. Um, Mr. Pasara, you say you set up a paramilitary group and equip them to deal with the, to deal with the crime situation. Mr. Greens, I'll put that to you. It's almost in there suggesting that the current established security agencies may not be up to the task. You agree, because some have suggested that 
that precisely is the problem. And a more radical approach, like has has been pro uh, proposed by Mr. Pasara, is the way to go. A paramilitary group. No, no, I don't agree. But uh, my disagreement perhaps is not based on sufficient information on the nature of this paramilitary group my honorable brother is proposing. I believe in a similar way to all the laws we have in our country, which we fail to implement, we have the existing agencies which need to be cleansed, redirected, retrained, and allowed to carry out their mandate, rather than having another layer of activity which also may fail, depending on how it is created and how it is controlled. But I would like him to perhaps give us more information as to how that uh, paramilitary um, organization may operate, and then perhaps he may be able to convince me. Thank you. Mr. Pastor, 30 seconds on that. He disagrees. He thinks it's not a way to go. Um, well, what I'm proposing here is going to have the opportunity of salvaging people who are normally arrested on the high street and they cannot get anybody coming. They will call the police, but the police cannot get there at the time that they should be freed. And when you have these people stationed in every region, the helicopter is high up, and whoever is stopping them on the way will know that there is trouble, and they will, they will leave them. And I think that that is the best way to respond to it. Otherwise, we will ever be in that same situation. Hassan Erga, yes. yes. I, I want to disagree a bit, but I think that the best thing to do is to make sure we deploy a lot of policemen at the highways and have stations at the highways, at least every 10, 15 kilometers. If we look at highway patrol teams, we are lacking highway patrol teams. And beside that too, we are lacking police day and night patrol. We only have very few policemen who block barriers just to make money. But what we need is proper security, and security for everyone, not just for the parliamentarians or the presidential candidates or government to, in power. To that, to, that, to that point you've just made, I want to bring you, Mr. Palu, in 30 seconds on the point about one of the biggest conversations currently, provision of personal bodyguards to all 275 members of parliament. Do you agree with that policy um, intervention? Yeah, I do, because uh, already some of them are ministers of states and they go along with the uh, security girls. So the remaining ones, if they are given protection, I believe it's on the, on the right direction. On the paramilitary, quickly, in a few seconds? Uh, I would suggest we, are, we deploy technology, because on the highways, we need technology, uh, and it will solve this problem more than uh, having this, uh, whatever the man was suggesting. I would suggest we use a technology, CCTV and the rest. Yes, um, with a paramilitary, my, I'm sorry. Yes, it, it, it may work, but the best thing is to make sure the institutions that exist now are given the power to work by themselves. That is the problem now. They should be given the leeway to take their own decisions and to work without interference from other people. Then they can uh, uh, enforce their own laws. They can work according to the law rather than be uh, influenced, as we saw, we've seen in cases like uh, election uh, violence and stuff like that. When there are cases like that, what becomes of the, the reports that we get? The state institutions are not being allowed to work because there's a lot of interference, and this is where we should allow these institutions the leeway to work and enforce their own laws. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Gentlemen and lady, thank you very much. We are moving on now to economic recovery. And just before we do that, I want to remind the audience about our code of conduct. We are all expected to remain silent during the debate, and you are specifically discouraged from applause and jeer. But before we go on to economic recovery, 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Ayaraga, you mentioned that uh, our agencies need to be looked at because they are full of foot soldiers. You also mentioned the issues about academic requirement. Already that is in place. What for you will be the minimum academic requirement quickly that's just 10 seconds or well, just um, first degree because you see you cannot be as an intelligent officer when you do not have intelligence 
first degree. Thank you. So we move on to economic recovery. And in building a post-COVID economy, starting with you, Asana Yariga, Mr. Akpalu, your LPG party has promised to achieve, what, 12.5% growth when voted into power. The NDC and MPP have been silent on certain growth targets. But the NDC has been promising the Ghana framework for industrial revitalization, support, and transformation, which is the Ghana first. While the NPP promises a second phase of a 100 billion Ghana city care program to revitalize the private sector, question is, what one major alternative do you propose against the two plans of the NDC and NPP? Production. In this country, we believe that everything that we consume is coming from outside. We spend $1.2 billion in the importation of rice alone, $800 million in the importation of tomatoes, $700 million in the importation of fish. We spend billions of dollars just to import food to consume. And the NDC and the MPP are still telling us that they are going to do A, B, and C. They are the same political party spending all these monies and they are talking about unemployment, unemployment, unemployment. We have deficits in food, so we need to change our consumption pattern to produce locally what we eat and eat what we produce. This is what we need, a production hub. When we are able to build a production hub, we go on to a manufacturing hub, then an industrial hub. You don't jump from up and say you are building skies, the buildings in the sky. That will not happen under my leadership. Thank you. Ms. Iva Green Street, so you have one major alternative you propose against the two plants of the NDC and NPP. Unfortunately, the problem is far more complex than needing just one major initiative as a soundbite to those who may be listening. We have a very complex situation facing us. The post-COVID economy is going to be very, very difficult to manage. They are only trying to take us to the end of the year, and whoever happens to be sworn into office on January the 7th, 2021, is going to have a very difficult task ahead of us. We have a vast debt overhanging this nation. We have a vast amount of arrears that we haven't paid all contractors, all invoices, all state organizations which are allowing this economy to be, economy to be weighed under this level of debt. Merely by paying all of these arrears, and not taking on new debt for new projects, cleansing the system of all these difficulties alone will provide a stimulus to move this nation forward. Ms. Akwalu, you have that alternative? Oh yeah, uh, we need to create entrepreneurs here in Ghana. We need to support our people. Uh, this post-COVID, you know, uh, I, I realize the government decided to distribute 600 million uh, Ghana cities or something like that to the entrepreneurs. And to me, some are getting 600 cities, 200 cities. To me, it's not enough. We need to create billionaires. We need to create millionaires. We need to help people to make it right here in Ghana because this country is full of problems. And problems and as a state, opportunities. We need to create uh, businessmen. We need to create entrepreneurs. So my government who empower Ghanaians to go into business, to build big businesses and own big enterprises. I don't want to see Ghana whereby everything is owned by foreign nationals. Though I believe in FDIs, but we need to empower our own to make it right here in Ghana. So we need to create a collective investment whereby millions of Ghanaians can put $500 each to create $500 million than bringing somebody with $500 million to invest here in Ghana. Thank you. Madam Bridget Jokbenoku, the PPP has an alternative for us. We've always talked about jobs, 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 jobs. And one would ask, how do we create these jobs? We have interregional highways, some of them partly constructed, some abandoned. I have a personal example from the Eastern Corridor, along which there's so much resource, and yet to access the resource is almost impossible. If we are able to um, construct these interregional highways, and we have about 18 of them, all the end roads are interregional inter highways, we open the country up to business, to investment, to industry, because we already have the resource there to which we can add value. I personally, I do something like that. And in, adding, in trying to add value, the entire value chain of these uh, industries 
are going to be providing jobs for the youth in this area. Indigenous industry, which therefore can be taxed and therefore can uh, uh, be revenue for the country. So let's start with the jobs. Thank you. Mr. Davida Pasera. Yes, um, certainly we need to look at investing in our people, encouraging our people to produce what we want. Um, we cannot continue to rely on foreign imports. And we have to begin first with stopping the importation of finished petroleum products. We have a refinery in Ghana, and fortunately now we produce crude oil. We should be able to refine and rather export finished product rather than importing finished product. We are burning the dollar on the street in our cars, and we say the city is falling. The city will collapse if we don't take steps to arrest the situation. My government will make sure Ghana does not export crude oil. It will be finished product refined in thermal oil refinery and export it. And that will be the starting point. And then we will go to our valleys. We have more fertile lands than where we import rice from. We should encourage rice production locally and stop importing. Thank that you very much. Thank you, Mr. David Apastera. So it looks like economic recovery issues will come up along the line. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we'll just go straight into the next part of questions. Then we'll get an opportunity for battles when issues come up again. And this links directly to the next question on job creation. And Madam Jobanuku, your party, uh, the PPP, you posted that the 2020 election must be based on job creation. In fact, you've stated that a short while ago on this platform. The NDC has promised to create one million jobs within the next four years, while the MPP argues they have created over two million jobs over their tenure and they on the back of 1D, 1F, and planting for food and jobs. Now, the LPG has promised to create 10 billion job fund and pay almost 4,800 each year to unemployed people. Uh, Mr. Hassan Ergas, APC, plans to provide monthly unemployment allowances, food benefits, uh, child allowance and maternity allowance as well. The PNC has promised to do something new by building a youth-led economy. Now, starting with the PPP, can each of you candidates explain why your plans on unemployment are better than what the NDC and MPP have indeed produced and proposed? Well, um, when we talk about jobs for the youth, we're talking about long-term sustainable jobs. We're not talking, you know, all the national youth, whatnot, the short-term uh, um, money in your hands, kind of three, three year, and then it's over kind of jobs. For, we're talking long-term. So you're establishing an industry where youth can work for a long period and have a sustainable income, a sustainable jobs. So when we talk about that, then we are talking about things like, and like I already said, opening up the country, setting up industry. He, uh, Mr. Passara talked about uh, uh, oil refinery. We talk about gold refinery. We've had a gold mine that has, lived, has been in existence for about 100 years. And even then, we haven't been able to establish a gold refinery where um, pe people in that region can work. And that is what we think about, that we can provide jobs to the youth in the Ashanti region, in areas like Obuasi, where they will be sustained, the jobs will be sustained over a period, mm -hmm. and not just over three years. Mr. Pasara, you've just heard Madame Bajit Mwenduku say, you say um, you, your focus is oil refinery. She says, her says, gold refinery. Is it that you believe on the question of job creation that your proposal of oil refinery in Ghana and not exporting oil is the way to create jobs and keep them locally instead of gold? Well, um, I think that I said oil refinery. You refine it and not propose, uh, we, exporting. We will refine the gold too. Because how much do we get from gold? Less than about 13 percent of what is exported comes back to Ghana. You cannot be producing something in your country and then your, your land is being degraded and then you get that peanut back. How can you survive it? And so I believe that refinery should cut across board all mineral resources 
so that Ghana will have the real income that we deserve from this production. Uh, Mr. Asanayarga, so your plan, can you demonstrate to us that your plan on creating jobs is better than NDC and MPP and what they proposed? Yes, very true. Um, first of all, when we want to create jobs, we need to look at production first. You don't just start by saying I'm creating jobs. You start creating jobs by producing. When you start with agriculture, you link it to industry. Automatically, you are producing enough and job creation is ongoing. Then you talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You inculcate it into our educational structure and make these students more useful when they come out of school to become more creative and innovative rather than relying on jobs from outside. They must create jobs. So we want to put job centers nationwide, link our job centers to every sector of the economy, right from industry, public service, uh, um, uh, um, uh, private sector, so you don't have to go around scouting looking for jobs. You go to the job centers, you have access to vacancies of jobs throughout the country, and immediately you key in your data and system into the system, and you get jobs. So job creation must start from production, manufacturing, and industrialization. Okay. Uh, Mr. Greenstreet, you agree? You have a different alternative? Well, first of all, you have to understand that you don't just wake up one day and decide you're creating jobs here and then creating jobs there. You have to have an overarching national development plan that has been subjected to rigorous analysis, rigorous assessment, and then you make a detailed decision based on areas where you believe there's comparative advantage and the greatest likelihood of creating the jobs based on the skills that you feel your people have. As it is now, because we do not even have the data based on a proper universal system of even capturing where Ghanaians are, whether they are even unemployed, what their skills are, then we are merely making these idle promises to satisfy those who may be listening to us for temporary benefits where they're sitting where they are. We have to be more rigorous in our identification of the steps that we are going to take as a nation, a nation which will lead to those types of job creations in so many different areas, whether it is in, uh, in refineries, whether it is in housing, whether it's in construction, whether it's in agriculture. Yeah, uh, Mr. Palu, your proposal was to create a 10 billion job fund. Yeah. We and pay almost 4,800 4, jobs. I just heard Ivor Green Street say, um, promises, idle I, I promises being made just to, you know, win political points. Ten billion job fund. Is yeah, it one of those? Yeah, because we have a lot of young men out there who have fantastic business ideas, but they don't have money to start those businesses that will create jobs for themselves and for others. So that is why LPG, we are proposing that we're going to set up a $10 billion equivalent fund to enable young men and women who have potential to start their own businesses, to have access to capital, to go into business. Aside that, we are also going to put money into sports development to train athletes, to train sportsmen, to get them good jobs, and also those that work uh, related jobs. We are also looking into reviving our uh, postal services to create 28,000 direct jobs. We want to build the world's largest poultry farm right here in Ghana to stop importation of or poultry. That will create about 100,000 direct jobs. We want to, in the two years in government, after two years in government, we want to build the world chocolate manufacturing company right here in Ghana to stop exportation of raw beans. We are going to make sure mm. we invest in building our roads, building Thank housing, you. and all will create jobs because we so, have what it takes to create jobs right here in Ghana. Now time for rebuttals, if there's any. On the point that Mr. Ever Greenstreet made about idle promises being made to create jobs, and I've pulled a lot of numbers out, NDC, one million jobs, MPP, two, two million jobs, 10 billion job fund, as we just had there. PNC has something new building. Anybody has a reaction? Or a rebuttal to that? Yes, yes. Mr. Hassan Ayaga. Um, I, I listened to my good brother and friend, Honorable Ambassador, who spoke about mining. Um, forgive me, let's fix the microphone so we can hear you. No, we can't hear Hello? you. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear I you. I listened to my big brother, Ambassador, who spoke about mining. You see, actually, we've lost it all. Our mining sector and our gold sector is in the hands of the foreigners. So when we talk about refinery, refinery, the Ghana itself is not refining anything. We're losing everything to the foreigners. 
The oil sector is in the hand. Look at all the sector of the economy. Mining, gold, diamond, bauxite, all is gone. What are we doing as a nation? What is ours? We are practically becoming 21st century slaves in our own country. Mr. Passer. Yes. Exactly. I agree with him. And that is why my government will revisit every contract signed with any foreigner in Ghana over our oil industry, over our mineral resources, and so on. Even now, our port is also handed over to some people. And I think that that is a very dangerous thing, that where you have all your resources in foreign hands, then you have a major problem. But we are going to take steps and look at and review all these contracts, mm. and that will help salvage the country. Yes, Madam Jubenuku. Yes, we've talked about local industry, and we have to jealously guard our local resources and our local industry and ensure that the jobs that have been created are not... Uh, uh, idle promises. Are not idle promises, but also let's not kill local industry and local businesses. Let's encourage them, let's support them. But one of the industries that, or one of the areas we must pay attention to as I stand here is women's industry. Support women's industry. I think in this COVID era, the one thing we have noticed or what has survived has been women's industry okay. in feeding, in clothing, mm. and, and the most necessary things that are required for uh, human capital development. Mr. Green, so you introduce that term. You will have a rebuttal 30 seconds. If not, we'll move on to our next uh, main section. Can I, can I, I, I want to talk to my good friend, Kofi Akwadu. He spoke about $10 billion. For, 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 forgive me, I'll come to that, but I see, I see that Ivor Green Street wants to go for 30 seconds, and I'll come to you. Yes, no Mr. Problem. Green Street. That's okay. You see, if you want to be taken seriously as a people, you yourself have to be serious. Even within our own government public financial management system, we admittedly lose about 500 million or so, according to the Audit Auditor General, every year. We are relying on a system which deals with payroll, but we have ignored the personal aspect of it. Who will take you seriously if, you, if, if you're sitting there watching your own money go down the drain and you're seeking to do things in other areas? Okay, yes. Yes, I, I listened to my good friend, Kofi Akwalu, who spoke about $10 billion fund. Already, our debt stock is almost $39 billion. I don't know how he intends to raise $10 billion to add up to our debt stock to make it $49 billion. So he should just tell us a little of how he intends to raise that amount of money to create yeah, jobs. Yeah, uh, you see, our problem, our problem in Ghana, in Africa, is we are afraid to borrow money to do the right things. In my government, I will borrow money to expand our economy. I will borrow money to expand Ghana's economy because we need to grow this economy. You, you mentioned $39 billion we are owing. $39 billion is peanut. The whole of Africa continent, we are owing $1.3 trillion. America alone is owing 31 trillion. Japan is owing 11 trillion. And the whole of Africa, we are owing 1.3 trillion, and we call this debt. To me, it's peanut. We need to borrow more okay. to expand our economy. Okay. <laughs> So on that note, on the issue of debt, we'll get into the next batch of questions then at this point. But Mr. Ivor Green Street, you've described their promises on job creation as idle. But those listening to us would want to hear your alternative, what you would do to create jobs. We are yet to hear that from you. 30 seconds. There, there are numerous potential areas for job creation. Number one, in the area of agriculture, we would be giving a fair and guaranteed market price to our farmers for their produce. Once with a rigorous analysis, we make a determination of the amounts of the various crops they were producing. We can go as far back as even the government of His Excellency President Kufo, who formed things like special president's initiatives. We thought there were going to be so many jobs created in cassava and industrial starch. What happened? We thought there were going to be jobs created in a golden age of business in the salt area. What happened? You need to do rigorous analysis in the areas in which you have comparative okay. advantage based on a detailed study from a national development plan and then feed that in 
Otherwise, your time is up. Your time is up, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Ivor Greenstreet. So since debt created a lot of excitement in the room, let's get into the question about debt. And since we started the last round with you, Madam Bridget Jogbenuku, we'll start with you, Mr. David Apasera. So one of the pitfalls that many countries have warned against in the race to bring back the economy from the ravaging effects of COVID-19 is expensive and expansive debt accumulation. Already, Ghana's debt stock is reaching dizzying heights, and Mr. Ayarga, you've made mention of it, which economists would like to call unsustainable. So you, Mr. Ayarga, for instance, has said publicly, your strategy would be to levy every Ghanaian 8,000 Ghana cities to pay off our debts in record time. So, Mr. Apasera, what exactly would each of you do differently to reduce Ghana's debt that has not been done before? Um, thank you. Uh, the issue here is for us to begin to export and res restrain ourselves for importation. That is how we can reduce our debt burden. If we are exporting finished products, French petroleum products, certainly we are generating more money. And if we generate more money, we can even take care of our development um, projects without looking outside to borrow. And that is how we can reduce the debt burden. We can also in increase our domestic production, go into the valleys, acquire the lands, deploy our farmers there, support them, and build agro-industries so that when they produce, we have it taken through the industry there, and then we can export some. And out of that, we generate in, um, income, and out of that income, we can put aside 30 percent to help the communities where we are taking this produce from. And certainly, by so doing, you will be generating enough income, and you will reduce your debt. Better. Okay. Thank you. Audience, once again, you're reminded you can't be doing what you're doing now. At the end of it all, you get the opportunity to clap and cheer all you want. Thank you. Ms. Ayarga, so what did I do as a citizen to be levied 8,000 Ghana cities to pay off our debts? We've borrowed so much with nothing to show. The first thing to do is to increase your production to stop borrowing. Secondly, you cut down on expenditure. You don't have to ex bring out unnecessary expenditure there by increasing your debt stock. Thirdly, we look at issuing our bonds, to issue our bonds to be able to raise enough locally to be able to finance our, our, our debt. Thirdly, I spoke about debt stock recovery, that I as president will pay 8,000 Ghana cities in my family. Every Ghanaian owe 8,000 Ghana cities has debt stock. If we begin to pay our debt, gradually we will understand the reason why we are borrowing. We have borrowed so much, and there is nothing, practically nothing, to show. And then we deal with corruption. We will put an integrated system called the National Data System to cap on corruption and how people earn money and how people spend. When we are able to curtail the expenditure of individuals in this country, I am very sure corruption will be cut down and our debt stock will not rise to where it is without anything to show. Ms. Ivor Green Street. I see no reason why the ordinary citizen of Ghana should be compelled to pay for the debts accumulated by either inefficiencies or the corrupt practices or inefficient banking practices that have been carried out by others. There are other ways of internally generating revenue. We can have an intentional industrial policy. We can mobilize internal resources. We can control capital inflows. We can earn more from our natural resources. We can be far more efficient in our own government practices. There are many things that we can do to recover this 230 billion debt, actually, that is hanging over our heads. And we must engage in those activities, but according to a detailed plan, not in an erratic manner without a deep thought process, because every decision you take has effects in other areas of the economy, including dealing with your foreign partners. So you have mentioned that you will borrow more, uh, Mr. <laughs> Kufiak Palu. So you have a strategy on us paying these debts. What's your strategy? You see, we need to grow, we need to grow the economy to be, in, to be able to generate revenue. When you don't increase your revenue and you think of uh, cutting costs, you can cut costs to zero. 
Okay? That's where you can get to. But revenue has no limit. You can grow the revenue and grow the re revenue. So the best strategy is to have a capital. Now, this capital can come in two forms, the equity and then the debt. And it's always cheaper to use debt to run any investment or any business than to use equity, because equity is very expensive. So my government will borrow the money to invest in this country, to grow the, every sector of the economy, to generate jobs and to grow and to create wealth. Because we have to create jobs, we have to create wealth in this country. Our young men are on the streets. They are suffering. They don't have any good place to even put the core home. We are going to borrow money to build housing, to create jobs and to create good homes for our people, than for them to live in slums. We will borrow money to expand the economy, to uh, produce poultry instead of importing poultry into this country. Thank you, Mr. Akwalu. Madam Bridget Jokmenuku, levy in the way to go, or you have a different way that would do it? Well, yes. Um, what we talk about is value for debt. So there is really not, nothing wrong with borrowing. All countries borrow. It is when you don't use the funds wisely that we find ourselves deep in debt. If the funds that are borrowed are used, like I mentioned before, in opening up the economy, opening up the country to business, investing on our roads, and used indeed wisely to open up so we ourselves are able to patronize what we produce. Today, we spend about um, $3 billion US dollars to import rice, to import poultry. We should be able to produce a lot of this and cut down on our for, uh, foreign exchange uh, requir requirements or needs so that we can then reduce the debt progressively, but not borrow and then not use the funds wisely. No nation has developed without debt. Most uh, nations do uh, use debt to develop. And therefore, uh, yes, to some extent, we will borrow. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Ayaga, it looks like uh, most of them disagree with you. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not, comfortable with, uh, I'm not comfortable with borrowing. <laughs> not at all. But, but you've heard Madame Bridget Jobenuku, you can borrow but use wisely. Uh, now, I'll tell you how. You, you see, when you borrow, you need to put up a collateral security to borrow. So, what are you going to trade for borrowing? We've traded with our bauxite, our oil, our diamonds, and everything. What do we have left? It is only when you don't know how to manage the economy that is when you go borrowing. You cannot have a family that every day you borrow to, to, to take care of your family. When you keep borrowing to take care of your family, the next thing is that you're going to lose your property, your house, that you live with the family. This is what they are proposing. We can produce in this country. We can manufacture. We can feed our economy without borrowing. We have vast land. We have labor. We have capital. Why do we have to borrow? We have borrowed so far till date. What have we achieved from borrowing? Come on, let's well, be serious. Mr. Palu, that was directly to you. Uh, quickly, then we come to Mr. Ivor Green Street who has a rebuttal as well. Mr. Palu. Sweetheart, if you look uh, the global the global debt ranking, yeah, you will see that the OECD countries, yeah, America, their debt to GDP is 108 percent. Japan is 238 percent. Italy is 127%. None of them is below 80%. But it made us believe that if we borrow and it exceeds 70% of our GDP, we are he heading towards HIPIC. I want to ask this question. Is America a HIPIC country? Is Canada a HIPIC country? All these OECD countries are they HIPIC countries. We need to borrow to expand our economy, grow jobs, create wealth, because we need them. If, okay. if, if he mentioned bonds, I want to know. I want to know from him. You have to educate me. What is bond? Is bond a debt or equity? Because he mentioned bond, that is going to issue bond, or he doesn't understand the word bond. Bond is also a debt. Okay. It looks like he, you understand. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I you understand think the that, difference. I think that Kofi is somewhere else, and then we'll no, you said you are going to issue bonds, and then <laughs> bonds are also debts. <laughs> Kofi is somewhere else. Why Kofi is, is used to borrowing. And I don't think, as a country like Ghana, our debt to GDP, if you don't know, is 78 percent. And um, America is 108 percent. We are not in America. We are in Ghana. No, we have to get I am to not going to are. be the president of a United States of America. I am going to be the president of Ghana. And no. I am telling you that we can money this country without borrowing. Look at our debt. In the microphone, please. Tell me. Tell me what we have to show with $32 billion. 
I can build a country better than Ghana with $20 billion. Mm. We have borrowed 32, 39 billion, sorry. Where are we? Look at our roads. Look at our streets. Look at our economy. We are practically like beggars. We keep begging every day. Don't you get it? No, okay. uh, uh, <laughs> madam. You get it? Uh, borrowing, borrowing. It's not always external borrowing. Okay. Okay. You borrow locally. Locally. Mm. Okay. Because right now, if I ask one million Ghanaians uh, to give me hundred dollar equivalent, at least we'll be able to get one million Ghanaians to give me hundred dollar equivalent. That will give me hundred million dollar. If it's about thousand dollar, it's one billion dollar. So we don't need always need to, his thinking is about traveling outside this country. I don't look at outside this country, I look within. We should be able to create wealth, we should be able to create capital within Ghana. Okay. We don't need to travel outside this place. Kofi, can you Thank justify you. can you justify the money we borrowed so far? Okay. Against that, our development and transformation. We have lost hope in politicians because we borrowed so much. Don't no, justify uh, what is not it's good. not. $39 billion no, is that, 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 That's okay, gentlemen. At, at this point, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Ivor Green Street. Well, I, I can assure you that uh, the CPP is a responsible government trying to restore faith in government. We will not borrow money to pay for recurrent expenditure. We will not borrow money to pay for old debt. We will rather not even start new projects. We'll concentrate on completing existing projects. The scale of our debt crisis is monumental, and we'll begin to face it next year. But there are areas where you can look at to generate revenue. For instance, Vodafone claimed at a point in time, after paying $2.1 billion to their parent company, that they hadn't made a profit for six years, and they didn't even want to pay a percentage of that in tax. It went to court, and later they tried to solve it. MTN sold their share in a company which produces towers. The money was sent and hidden in Mauritius. They claimed they didn't want to pay that capital gains tax, which would have earned Ghana 400 million. There are areas where we can tackle remittances for these foreign companies. We can change the laws with regard to how much we earn from our resources. Those are areas we can look to generate more money internally. But to go and borrow okay. and not use it for long-term productive ventures would be completely insane, in fact, madness. Evans. Thank you very much. Um, Evans, we'll end let me add up, let me add up to what he's saying. No, can no, I? We have oh, to sorry. end that round. We, we have to point. move on. Just one second, please. No, no. no. We'll, we'll come back. When, when it gets your turn, you would uh, get an opportunity to rebut with the time you have. I want to go now to ease of doing business, really tied into what we're discussing. I want to start this time with uh, Madame Jogunuku. Um, and, and, and get the rest to also chip in. Ghana has, uh, and you're a business woman as well, you do business and so you understand this. Ghana has ranked poorly since 2016 on World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, with 2020 ranked being 118th out of 190 economies. Reasons for the weak performance include difficulty in starting business, enforcement of contracts, payment of taxes, trading across borders, dealing with permits, and property registration. What two major incentives would, you, would your government provide to the private sector to improve the business climate and improve Ghana's performance on the index? Well, um, first of all, we go back to the law. The laws must be enforced and the laws must be implemented to the letter. I think that, um, for example, we've had issues with our Guta and other nationals trading in the retail space, for example. Those laws ought to be enforced so that the Ghanaian business person also is made comfortable and is able to trade in their country without, being, without feeling like other nationalities are being allowed to infringe on their rights as Ghanaian traders. Another thing we need to do for the Ghanaian business people is the ease of capital. They should be able to access uh, uh, loans, as, since we've been using that word, easily, in order to boost up their business. And indeed, government must also make, make available to them schemes, and this is what the PPP would do. Loan schemes where a large group like Guta can access and know that with low interest rates so that they can pay back 
and grow their businesses. I think one of the things that plays the guta from what we heard from them is the high interest rates, which doesn't make them competitive to okay. other people who are coming into the business. Mr. Space. Pasara, two major incentives to improve the business climate. One is to make sure that the institutions that are to give you the needed documents react promptly. Areas like, I mean, business registration should not be a problem to get. And then we should have our banks that should give, you know, loans to the, to the, to the businessman. You don't have to go through a very rigorous kind of struggle before you can access loans to do business. And we should be able to assist the business community with tax holidays. Those who are beginning to uh, come up with businesses should be given tax holidays and tax exemptions. That will help the business community to grow. And I think these are the areas that we have to tackle. Um, Mr. Asana, you're a businessman yourself. What would you do to major interventions to improve the climate for those in the industry? One, reduce taxes. Two, encourage the businesses to have an enabling environment to grow. Three, to support businesses with capital to build up. Four, to help the business, guarantee them with land, labor efficiency for the businesses to thrive. All along, when you work around in this country, you realize that most people have start capital and they don't have working capital. So sometimes businesses go down because in the process of trying to build up and there are so many taxes that you can pay, you're forced to use the little working capital you have. And when these cannot sustain you, these businesses go down. And now the most important thing is efficiency of labor. Our labor force sometimes are not that qualified to support businesses to grow. So businesses, men and women, come into this country and looking for the right labor, and it's a problem. So we need to build a labor force that is very sustainable, strong, and robust to help this country move forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenstreet, your interventions? At a point in time, when you studied economics, it was not called economics. It was called political economy. And that is because it is the politics which controls the economics. But over the last 20 or so or 30 years, they have created the impression that economics is a special area on its own which should be allowed propagate this theory, which actually has failed, that it is only the private sector which is the engine of growth. It is only retrenchment, deregulation, reduction of taxes, which will produce success. Actually, that is why we have vast unemployment. And that is why we find ourselves in the situation we are in now, because that approach has entirely failed. We need state intervention to provide long-term availability of capital, as has been done in countries which are successful like Sweden, Germany, Singapore, Taiwan, and elsewhere in an intentional manner with a desired result. We also have to go further. Thank you. Mr. Palu. Yeah, we are going to support uh, businesses to grow. So to do that, we must be sure uh, those who issue permits and licenses does that on time to avoid any unnecessary delays. Uh, so we have to reduce all the times of acquiring licenses and permits. We are also going to build a credit economy, whereby we make sure we have everybody identified with unique identification number, and then also proper address system that will link the two together to reduce the standard deviation, because interest rate here in Ghana is so high. We need to bring it down to at least uh, a single digit. And to do that, it will help small businesses and uh, middle uh, uh, level businesses to grow and to assess capital. And also, this processing fee and administration fee, when somebody goes for a loan from a bank, we have to relegate that to, to the bottom because it's not helping this country. This is the only country where you borrow money and then you have, you have to take some money from you up front, which is wrong. Thank you. One of the key challenges to the ease of doing business in Ghana has been identified also as corruption, and we'll move to corruption now. 
And on that, on that front, uh, Mr. Apalu of the LPG, you've suggested that the NPP and NDC parties have created a system of governance and administration where power is frequently misused for personal gain and where ordinary citizens have difficulty getting work done in government offices without having to pay bribes. So, Mr. Ayariga, your manifesto has also said you will crash out the bad corruption nuts in our society by building a nation of enduring spirits to resist the temptation of corruption. I'll start this round with you, Ms. Ivor Greenstreet. What is it about corruption that makes it attractive to those who engage in it? And what realistic strategies would you adopt to halt corruption in Ghana's business environment? Well, I, I think it should be quite obvious what makes it attractive to people who would wish to engage in it is that they can make uh, large amounts of money without having to do any work at our expense. And of course, most of this normally takes place at the intersection between public procurement, either for goods or even for the corruption of recruitment of wrong types of personnel. So we go have to have to go far further with the National Anti-Corruption Plan, which has significant details about how to deal with all of these problems that we continue to face as a society in terms of corruption at the highest level and the corruption that permeates right down to the petty levels of our society. And and so I don't think the battle is ever won, but I think we have to re-intensify the efforts of the state agencies, and we will be looking at how to further utilize the supply commission and uh, procurement methods to try and tackle the problem at its root cause. Mm. Mr. Akwalu, so you mentioned that they do business without having to pay bribes in government offices. As a businessman, you've had the opportunity to pay bribes, and what is it about it that makes it attractive and the strategies in place? Yeah, uh, we make sure uh, we deploy mystery shoppers around uh, because we need to fight corruption and we need to fight it well. And we're also going to uh, compare everybody in this country to file his annual return, tax returns. Everybody, if you're 18 years and above, you're going to file your annual tax return. And that will disclose your income, your liabilities, and your assets. And it, it will help us to keep corruption one way or the other. So we also make sure uh, our officers are paid and paid well, and they are paid on time. So corruption to us is everywhere, but we'll do everything possible, humanly possible, to eradicate it. Do you pay bribes? No, I don't. Okay. Ms. Madam Bridget Dugwenuku, so we're talking about corruption and what major, you know, uh, what about it that makes it attractive and what you do to curb it? Well, what makes it attractive is very fundamental, and it's fundamental to our constitution, in fact. Um, we still don't publicly declare assets of public officials, we, it's, it's, and that must be done. We have not separated the office of the Attorney General from the Minister of Justice, and therefore we cannot um, openly prosecute uh, public officials who are found to be corrupt, because um, the, the minister is the same as the attorney general. That office is not separated. Indeed, there is a, a special prosecutor, but he is also beholden by the attorney, attorney general, and the attorney general must be in a position to want to prosecute cases of corruption. Um, we must separate parliament from the executive so that we don't have parliamentarians who are also ministers who then rubber stamp every deal that comes through uh, parliament because uh, they, 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 they are in the know what is going on at, uh, in the cabinet. And also we need to implement the RTI Act where people want to know, okay. uh, have information and not pay for it to know what goes on or what assets uh, public officials hold. Thank you. Mr. Pasara. Yes. Um, corruption is thriving because people enjoy free when they go and they are corrupt and they get the money, they, nothing holds them to account. The laws do not apply. Now, if we want to stop corruption, we have to track down corrupt practices and people must be prosecuted. People must be prosecuted and their properties confiscated. If you know that you go into corruption and if it comes to light, you are going to suffer the full rigors of the law. You will stop it. In other areas, in other domains, you are even shot. 
we hunt for corrupt practices. If it comes to crisis, my government will be considering tougher measures. And those tougher measures will stop people from um, indulging in corruption. The other thing is that we have to ensure that there is um, um, access declaration of everyone, especially the top level um, okay. directors and ministers. There must be asset declaration. Thank you. Ms. Ayaga. Very simple. It's attractive because we don't punish and because we heal the people who are corrupt. My system of governance is going to be a national data system which will give information and detailed information of every Ghanaian. Where you work, your fingerprint, the amount of money you, you earn, the number of houses you have, the kind of cars you drive, we will link it to know how you get all these properties. If we find that you're corrupt, that your salary cannot buy you the kind of cars you use, your salary cannot fetch you the kind of house you live in, you will have to answer to a special independent prosecutor, not the one we have, an autonomous special independent prosecutor, and he will take you on. You will declare your asset no matter who you are. And we have a social security that will track information of every Ghanaian working in Ghana, living in Ghana, and doing business in Ghana. It is very simple. Punish them, and everybody will be scared. I will go to jail. The first day I become president, I'm going to sit in the cells. This is to show that anybody corrupt will not have it easy in my government. How many Thank days you will you be in cell? How many days will you be in cell? Come again. How many days do you plan? Just one day. Until? Just one. Just one day. That's enough. <laughs> okay. So, Ms. Pasara, quickly, you have talked about tougher sanctions in place, including where some elsewhere people are shot and hanged. Would that yes. be in your books as well? No, no, no. Okay. We're not going to kill anybody. No, I'm talking for... about Mr. Pasara. Oh, okay. You mean, uh, uh, you mean that is an overstatement? I'm saying that you mentioned that elsewhere others are shot and hanged when they engage in corrupt acts, and you talked about in, uh, you bringing on board tougher sanctions uh, for those who do that. I'm asking if it will include getting shot and being hanged. Mr. Pastor, when you were speaking, yeah, you said that. in your point, yeah. you said that elsewhere when you engage in corruption, people are shot and hanged. Yes. You said that. I said that. And then you said that you would introduce tougher sanctions. Yes. The question is, are you considering also introducing those draconian measures as you have pointed out happens elsewhere as part of your tougher Certain, measures? Certainly. If we try the tougher punishment and it doesn't restrain people from corruption, we have to go that, that, that length. And when we go that length, if you steal and you know, if you are caught, you will die. You will not steal. You are stealing to, to eat. And when you know that you will be caught and shot, you will not do it. And I think that Ghana has to be salvaged from corruption. Corruption is our main problem. That is causing us what we have, the misery that we have. Ghana is a fabulously rich, resource country, and we don't have to be suffering. It is corruption. And, you know, we look at it, we borrow, mm. and we can't show. But Andrew Benugu, I saw the look on your face. You have a reaction to that? About people being shot? For being corrupt. Well, let's implement the law and um, apprehend those who are involved in corruption first. I don't believe in people being shot for corruption, but I'm sure that there are tougher sanctions than what we are Im implementing now. Yes, Mr. Greenstreet. No, well, the problem is, you can see, that both of the parties which have been ruling us for the last 28 years have been corrupt. They go into opposition, they claim about finding things difficulty, all of a sudden they are in office, and they appear to be happy moving around with all the money in the world. They run flamboyant election campaigns. Nobody knows where any of the money comes from. They claim to be enforcing corruption. They lose power. Another party comes in. All of a sudden, they are leading flamboyant lives. Clearly, that's where the corruption is with them. Mm. I want to move on. What, okay, Can I? I see a rebuttal, 30 seconds. And yes, I'll take yes, you, yes. I, yes, I, Asana Erga. Yes, my big brother here. I think that we don't want to kill anybody in this country. <laughs> that is number one. What we need to do is to put measures to make sure that they are not corrupt. 
to put standards to be able. You see, the national data system that I want to bring on board will prevent everybody from being corrupt. It will track you down. It will take detailed information about you. You cannot be corrupt. But when we begin to punish, like I said, first day in jail, everybody knows that if the president sleeps in that room, as for you, you know where to sleep. I will separate you from your wife, and you know where to go. Madam Jubanuku. Yes. Uh, the two parties have been corrupt because of the same thing I talked about, the fundamental issue, their reluctance to see to the review of the Constitution, which then will separate these powers, which will uh, uh, um, have fewer ministers in Parliament and will indeed give us the rights to information and also the public declaration of assets. So let's go to the fundamental. If we continue with these two parties, or any party for that matter, operating with that constitution, this is what we're going to have. We can never get to the bottom of the uh, corruption. Thank you very much. Let's uh, link to this is our next set of questions. And this set, I'll start with you, Mr. Kofi Palu. It's on financial crimes. Now, there have been widespread reports uh, very recently about illicit financial flows, with Ghana being blacklisted on the uh, EU radar, while a diplomatic row we know is currently brewing over Ghana's embassy in Belgium over alleged similar transactions. It's going to be investigated, we understand. Economic data indicates that Ghana loses over 3 billion US dollars to illicit financial flows from trade with developed countries. Now, the recent Thinkson uh, Files leak, which cited some Ghanaian entities, received less attention from government and the business community. What will you do in your first 100 days to delist Ghana from the infamous list? To delist Ghana from such list, then it means you don't want to do well with this country. Because they will blacklist you when they see you are doing well. They will blacklist you when they see your country is doing well. So please, uh, to my understanding, everybody everywhere in the world, or every country in the world, there's corruption going on. America, UK, Ireland, everywhere. But because we are in the developing country, so they easily associate us with this kind of corruption tag. So my government will make sure we empower Ghanaians to make it and make it right here. Just for clarity, you leave Ghana on the blacklist of the European Union. I don't think, because we need to uh, have evidence of all these things that they're talking about. OK, thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam Jubanu. How would you delist us? What's I, I think that we must, the government must show commitment to these issues of the illicit trade and corruption. I think you mentioned in your intro that not, not, nothing has been said, or not much has been said about these issues that came up two days yeah. ago. And if we are not addressing it, or we are not trying to get to the bottom of it, then it does mean that there must, we, there must be some uh, they must be complicit in the issues that are coming up about money, laund money laundering and uh, corruption and, well, all these illicit trades. Mm. So governments must show commitment. They must address the issue almost immediately. They must show that they are indeed clean and not involved in these issues. And speak up to it publicly and to the European Union, engage the European Union to show how clean they are uh, to this effect. Uh, Mr. Passera, we were uh, put on that uh, European blacklist on the 1st of October. If you win in your first 100 days, what's your strategy to get us off? My strategy is to look at um, um, the security services that are supposed to check these crimes, money laundering, goes through the airport. They don't go through uh, the sea. They go through the airport here. And we have to make sure that is checked. If it goes through the embassy, the ambassador and whoever has sent it there, the government acts promptly. The prompt action of the government will gain back the confidence that other governments have to accord to Ghana. And so I think that it is just the issue of who is in the, the seat and that is why PNC is coming. We are going to make zero tolerance for 
these kind of crimes, and that will bring back the image of Ghana. Uh, Mr. Hassan Ayaga. First of all, I will engage them, negotiate to know what were the terms that were actually blacklisted. And if I'm able to find out the terms, I'll deal with that terms accordingly. Secondly, we need to restore hope and confidence in the foreign, with our foreign partners. Most likely, it's about money laundering. So we will make sure we stop money laundering in this country. People should begin to use their visa cards, master cards, and all cards for transactions in Ghana and outside Ghana. No more cash transaction. We will make sure that we have a cashless economy where people begin to do trade with their master cards and transfer of resources right from where they purchase their goods to the destination which the goods are coming from. It is very important for us to know that it's easy to blacklist Ghana because people bring in money here and pass through the money and take it out of this country. And it's been on and on. It's not the first time. It's not because somebody hates Africans. It's because we ourselves are not serious. We're not, we're not really serious. We're not doing what is right. We want to do wrong things and be applauded. Mm. And we must stop doing that. Mr. Greenstreet. Well, these are legal, legal matters. Uh, each case of uh, different countries which have been blacklisted will be dealt with um, according to the specific circumstances. But the problem is with these countries is that they are the, actually the ones who encourage most of these practices. You remember some time ago, the senior minister passed through Dubai and they were praising Ghana for having exported $7 billion worth of gold through Dubai only for him to get back to Ghana and realize that on our books, there was only 2.3 billion which had gone through our books. Therefore, five billion dollars worth of gold, of which 80% of that money is supposed to be repatriated to Ghana, had disappeared. We had 145 companies investigated by CID. Up to now, nothing ever happened about it. But all that gold goes where? To the country which has the four largest gold refineries in the world, Switzerland, to produce gold and engage in their activities. They have double standards, but we will look at the terms of why we've been blacklisted and determine whether it's in our interest to comply with them. Mm. We move on to natural resource now. Because there's been a lot of talk about our gold and crude oil, so let's talk about our natural resource management. And Mr. Passera, we'll start this round with you. While mining directly employs a significant number of people, mineral revenues, on the other hand, are directly deposited in the consolidated fund, whose use is often arbitrary. So the NPP government has attempted to maximize the value of mineral royalties through the Ejapa Agreement, which has attracted widespread controversy. Now, do you agree with the NPP on this trajectory? And what would you do differently to maximize mining revenues for the Ghanaian people? Well, I, I think that um, the, um, the position the government is taking, uh, maybe the difficulty is that um, people are not properly educated on it. If there is proper education, um, investment, with what we get from our mineral sources is very necessary if we have to get a very good value for it. And so we, I will look at it and then we will go into the details of such a negotiation and see if it is the right thing to do, then Ghanaians will know and then we'll go ahead with it. Thank you. So, Ms. Ayaga, you agree with the NPP trajectory, especially with the Ejapa Agreement or the Ejapa Way, and what would you do differently to maximize mining revenues for the Ghanaian people? First of all, taking the mining, mining royalties from the mining sector to Ajapa was wrong, because Ajapa is going to do the same thing the uh, mining royalties are doing. So why do you assign the same company, uh, different people to do the same work, when the same company can do that work? So what we need to do is, first of all, make sure we give mining licenses to local Ghanaians. That is the indigents. We will not give concession to foreigners anymore. No foreigner will mine in Ghana under my leadership. I will regulate mining and make sure that the youth of this country get mining licenses to engage, whether small scale or large scale. We'll support them with all equipment to mine so that the royalties in this country stays here. We can make good use of here. We don't have to borrow. We don't have to trade it to borrow money. It's just like we are borrowing to pay workers. That is not the right thing to do. 
We need to begin to understand that our resources, mineral, natural resources, is for us. And we must begin to manage it well to be able to sustain Ghana and grow our economy. Thank you. Mr. Green Street. Well, there, there are risks and rewards in every financial transaction, particularly one in which you seek to monetize resources well into the future. The problem with this particular transaction is that the scope of it seems to be far wider and unclear to all of those who have attempted to fully examine the, the um, contract as a whole. It also seems to deal with vast areas of mining licenses and gold areas, which as of yet have not even been fully identified. And in many respects, from our perspective, it is like putting the cart before the horse. Here we have, under the MPP government, between 2000 to 2008, with the introduction of stability provisions, which were rushed through Parliament, Newmont were able to have, through these stability provisions, only pay 1.7% royalties on gold. Then under the NDC, with respect to gold fields, the same thing was achieved between 2004 to 2008 against advice from a committee which was established uh, against those provisions, 1.7% against stability provisions. Rather, we should be concentrating on how much we can earn from our gold now Thank you. and then determine whether that should be sold into the future. Thank you. Mr. Apollo. Uh, our problem in Africa has to do with capital formation. We always rely on foreign direct investment. That is why we are only depending on uh, royalties and the rest. But if we have been able to form our own local capital, whereby we do collective investment, we'll be able to own and control our natural resources. So in my government, I'm going to empower Guyanians everywhere to come together, put resources together, to form capital and control all the natural resources that we have here in Ghana. And then we also add value to them. Because we don't want a situation where we'll be sending oil, we'll be sending diamond, uh, bauxite, raw state from these shores. No, we need to add value to create jobs and to create wealth for all Ghanaians. So my government will make sure Ghanaians control Ghana resources. Thank you. Madam Jokbenuku, you agree with the NPP trajectory, and what would you do differently to maximize mining revenues for the Ghanaian people? We believe that the Japa royalties deal has actually, the royalties have been undervalued, and we will be able to maximize the value of our royalties, not by going the Japa way. And frankly, sometimes we look at investments and only look at the cash value, but we need to look at it in the value of investment. And if we invest our royalties in uh, projects like our heritage projects, and we can by ourselves identify some of these projects, and it will be heritage to people coming after us, and not necessarily keep it in cash form or put it in an investment where we see the cash only the cash value of it. It will be to our benefit. Mineral resources should go to the development of our country and into projects that will be beneficial to the coming generations, not necessarily kept uh, as uh, money uh, for the future. So let's look at it in terms of the investments, in terms of the value of investments. And we maintain, uh, the PPP government maintains, that the Japa has been undervalued. I want to come to you, Ms. Ayaga. Uh, this is a follow-up question, so you have 30 seconds to deal with this. I mean, it, and it's a mining question still. There have been increased calls by Ghanaian industry captains, uh, politicians and citizens to increase local participation in critical sectors of our economy. One sector is mining. Now, Ms. Ayaga, you have said under your leadership no foreign company will engage in mining. That's, that's what you've said. However, the mining industry is a capital-intensive one. And even for safe small-scale mining, you need at least $500,000 to get it started. Now, the NDC promises to attract foreign investment into mining sector. So is the MPP also hoping to leverage foreign investment as well in what it calls a BAFTA deal, at least with bauxite. Now, looking at the relatively weak and risk-averse financial sector that we have in Ghana, 
Why would you issue mining license to only Ghanaians? And are you not going to stifle growth in the sector? Let me tell you what the NDC and the MPP are doing. They're selling out our sovereignty to the foreigners. And I, Hassan Ayerga, would not sell what God has given Ghanaians to the foreigners. It is if the foreigners can borrow money, like my good friend is talking about borrowing every time, if the foreigners can guarantee loans to be able to run large-scale mining companies, what stops the ordinary Ghanaian from doing that? Why won't you guarantee the ordinary Ghanaian to mine in this country so that our resources and royalties will be paid directly to us? Yeah, I they mean, take out the resources. Let, let, let me come, let, time is, let me come to the CPPs, uh, my brother Green Street, because uh, ideologically, um, what Mr. Ayaga is suggesting seems to be something that the CPP have articulated before. You agree? Uh, Mr. Ayaga is entirely right. And this is where you were earlier talking about job creation, where you're talking about primitive capital accumulation for the ordinary Ghanaian business person. They are the right people who should be benefiting from those resources. Artisanal mining ought to be supported. And this is where the state can intervene. If these equipments are expensive, the state can intervene by providing them with assistance, long-term loans, help to protect the environment, help for training, help with the chemicals to develop those industries and earn those gold because then we will be creating multi-millionaires in Ghana who will be Ghanaians, not Chinese and not foreigners. And that is what we have to do to protect this nation, protect the people of this nation and take us forward. Mr. Faru, no foreign company will engage in mining in Ghana. You, so, you, you back, you agree with that view? Oh, no, I don't agree with that. But we need to support our own. You see, like, uh, my problem with our, our continent is that we, we are not able to create capital, and that's what we need to look at. Uh, my suggestion is about collective investment. If you can get, let's say, one million people coming together to invest hundreds, $100, $100, $100, $100, it's $100 million. So if you ask yourself, how much did these guys, uh, Newmont or whatever, brought to Ghana to invest. You see that it's about 200 million or so. So that 200 million, we should be able to encourage Ghanaians everywhere to come together, mm. put resources together, to raise more of that, more of that to invest. So even if, when you don't have so, the Sorry, your, your, time, your time is up. Your no, time is just, just, just one no, second. No, no, sorry. The strict, strict no time I agree. On, on, the, on the rebuttal. Um, a substantive question to you. I see you, you're smiling, Mr. Yaga, but uh, this is a substantive question. So you have 30, uh, uh, one minute. Uh, to answer that uh, question, and it's related because it's energy. So you have promised to reduce tariffs for electricity consumption for what you call the more you consume, the less you pay system for industries and businesses. However, one key challenge the NPP and NDC have struggled to deal with is revenue generation. But besides high consumption does not necessarily translate toward high productivity. How would you link productivity with high power consumption and at the same time solve the energy issue that we have? First of all, let's talk about the solving the energy issue. We're going to bring three, uh, the mixed energy generation. First of all, we look at wind, the coastal, coastal areas to generate using turbines, to, uh, wind, wind wheel to generate free, free electricity. Then we look at the sun. Then we we'll use solar system to generate power using solar system. Then we use turbine. That is the dams that we're creating, and then we create energy through dams. Now, what I want, I, I mentioned there about the more you consume, the less you pay. You see, factories and companies, they, they consume a lot of energy. And if we give them that kind of tariffs, that they consume more and pay less, they will be able to pay adequately for the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, the production we make. In this country, the reason why we're losing so much with energy is because of illegal connections. People don't, generation is a problem. That is number one. Collection is another problem. And the collection is the major problem because a lot of energy go waste. We don't get to collect energy. And that is why the energy sector is suffering. People are not paying. Thank you. Very few people are paying for the electricity. Mr. Greenstreet, how would you link productivity with high power consumption at the same time solve the legacy issue of low revenue in the energy sector? Well, clearly the energy sector debts 
uh, particularly with respect to electricity cooperation, is uh, of, of great says, source of worry to the Convention People's Party. In fact, we would have, uh, particularly in this uh, COVID area crisis where uh, there have been subsidies on electricity and therefore less, even less revenue than normal made available to them, we would have insisted that all the arrears owed them would have been paid prior to that uh, process being embarked upon. Because otherwise, you are then placing further and further stress on, a, on an already very distressed organization. I hope that is not being done as a prelude to begin once again the attempt that was previously made to take over that corporation and take it into the private sector, um, which occurred some time ago. We believe that is a sector that requires um, a state support, state intervention. It requires uh, a, 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 a form of protection because it is a strategic national asset, asset that is commonly owned by the people of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. Greenstreet. Mr. Akpalu, you have a solution to the legacy issue of low revenue in the energy sector. Uh, it's all to do with productivity and efficiency at the sector. We need to make sure uh, we remove all these bottlenecks. Uh, in regards to uh, illegal connections and all kind of stuff, and also government uh, non-payment uh, non of uh, tariffs, because there are a lot of government institutions where they consume electricity, but they don't pay. So it's only left with the ordinary Ghanaian out there to pay. And I would suggest in our government, we will make sure uh, government agencies make provision for electricity to pay so that they all, they all have what they call the prepaid meters. So they are going to have uh, post payment whatever system that's, uh, that's led us to these uh, legacy debts and, so, and all those kind of stuff. Everybody consuming electricity will pay for it. Thank you. Madam Bridget Jack well, first of all, with the PPP government, we'll work our way towards reducing thermal dependency on thermal energy, which is the most expensive. We will encourage um, solar, renewable energy in the form of solar and wind. And in fact, with companies that rely on these, we will give tax in incentives so that uh, they, we, they, they are rewarded for their use of uh, cheaper and renewable energy. Um, one thing that has plagued our energy industry is, in fact, the political interference. Political interference in areas like the generation and the distribution of power must, must be completely out. We must leave it to the experts, the experts, the technicians, the technocrats who know how to run this industry. What government must do is to equip them. What the PPP government will do is to equip them with a uh, machinery so that they can fairly distribute power and energy over across the country. So these are some of the incentives that we want to give. These are some of the areas in which the PP go PPP government wants to uh, make its way in, in the area of energy. Thank you. Mr. Pasara. Yes. Um, the PNC government is going to look at the contracts that have been signed regarding the production of um, energy, electricity, and we are going to review them. Cost of electricity is high, and you cannot industrialize with the cost of electricity high. So we have to review that, and we have to look at other ways of generating electricity. We will look at renewable energy, solar energy, and we are going to even go into an area of nuclear fission, if that is a possibility to generate cheap energy. That is the only way we can industrialize. So certainly we are going to look at it as with the technical um, people put in place to look at these things. The already signed contracts that we have used to produce electricity. How is it beneficial to Ghana? And some of these things we have to review them so that the cost of electricity will come down. Okay, I see Madam Jogwenuku's hand yes. up. Uh, um, oh. Furthermore, government must pay its debt. Government owes the energy industry a, gr a great deal of money and they must be responsible and pay. And that will also help in cutting down the cost of energy in this country. And uh, Ms. Ayaka? Yes, uh, it's very easy to generate energy, um, uh, value for money for our energy sector. We have over 20 million homes in this country. 
3 million offices, more than 3 million uh, public offices and private offices. If we're going to put a flat rate for each home, let's say 100 Ghana cities for each household, we are looking at 200 million Ghana cities every month for our energy. This can solve the problem. We don't generate even up to 50 million Ghana cities in a month. So why don't we put a flat rate, 100 Ghana cities for households, 100 Ghana cities for offices, 100 Ghana cities for businesses, and then everybody is willing to pay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to the next substantive uh, question, and I'll start with you, Mr. Ivor Greenstreet. The flooding has once again arrived. With it, consequent poor sanitation conditions and distraction it leaves behind, and is competing with Ghana's quest to be the cleanest city in Africa. Yet we have created at least seven bureaucracies, including the Sanitation Ministry, which draws huge financial resources, as we know, from the state while pretending to solve the problem. What will be your grand strategy to correct our problem of flooding and poor sanitation? I thought you were going to ask me whether the journey towards Accra being Africa's cleanest city has been achieved or not. But perhaps maybe the answer is so obvious you didn't want to ask me that question. But certainly, as you state, with the number of agencies which have overseen this area, not just in this last government, in fact, not just since the beginning of the Fourth Republican Constitution, but prior, we would have expected by now to have achieved far greater evidence of a solution to the problem. Yet every year, we have the same announcement that governments are even preparing for the floods. Yet the floods still come and cause the same havoc. I believe that further investment over a shorter period of time is required to actually create the solution that they are all aware we need documentation, plans, and the strategy required for the sector in terms of where the water flows from, from out of Accra, how it comes in, the damage it, cause, mm. it causes, has already been done. Okay. The important thing is how to implement mm. those things which have been decided. Mr. Apollo, so what's your plan to solve our flooding and poor sanitation problem? Well, in regards to sanitation, we'll make sure uh, all waste uh, from uh, our homes are collected every morning and dump uh, in our dumping site. Uh, we make sure people pay for it to be collected from their homes. We make sure we have uh, san uh, sanitation inspectors all over the country going around inspecting people, uh, compounds, uh, and neighborhoods to find out those who are throwing whatever. So we we'll punish people. And then we'll also make sure uh, we pay people to do the work and do it on time. Um, Madam Bridget Gwenuku, big challenge with flooding and poor sanitation. What's your big plan? Well, the states will plan or replan the infrastructure. I think that housing and uh, uh, housing for low-income people in areas where, uh, which are flood prone must be redesigned and we, we looked at. Um, leadership will play a key role. It doesn't look like the current housing minister has done much in the area of uh, housing and of course people in the flood, pl flood prone areas. We have been having flooding since 1994, if, as long as I can remember. And it's constantly in the same areas. And it seems as if we just don't have a plan to fix those, uh, 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 those, those, those problems. Leadership must put aside the politics and address the problem in a humanitarian manner. And that is what we want to do. It's not about trying to capitalize on the um, disaster in order to get votes, but also to look at it and house people appropriately so that they don't get, uh, feel the brunt of the, the, the disaster over and over again. Uh, Mr. Papa, course, your plan on this? Yes. Um, when we come to power, immediately we are going to desalt the drains. We have to dredge them and get it cleared 
Secondly, we have to put in place an authority, town planning authority. We will create that, give them the required legislation that enables them to replan the towns. Some houses have to be repositioned so that we can, there are a lot of houses constructed in waterways. That is what is causing the, the flooding. And then we would have to look at the possibility of having to bring back um, hygiene and uh, um, uh, hygiene uh, program, which brings back this whole system of town guards, so that they manage the system. Every house must have a toilet facility, and government has to find a way of providing that so that we have a clean society. It will be impossible to have a country like Ghana being looked at as a, a country that is not clean. I think that is a very bad knock on us. Um, Mr. Ayaga. Evans, first of all, we look at education of waste collection and disposal right from the schools. We need to educate our kids on how to throw waste and how to collect waste. Secondly, we need to put a proper drainage system in our roads, on our roads, on our gutters, clean our gutters, and make sure that we have clean gutters every day. Our gutters are choked. We wait until when it's raining season before we start cleaning our gutters. There must be sewage system, underground system, so that we don't have water just flowing on the top. We should have proper sewage underground system that the water can equally pass through. Then we look at companies with waste companies that can handle waste management properly. We have beans all over. People should stop littering around. Then we put a fan on bottled water and sachet water. When you buy water, the bottled water becomes a fan. You pay for you return it and get money for, for the bottle. So when we do that, you will realize that we will control this system by not allowing people to throw this bottled water that gets our gutters choked. Mm. Okay. So, I'm sorry. So that is that is a substantive question on the on sanitation, but it's linked to this is housing. As I've heard all of you mention that uh, you know it's there's a there's a link to it. We're going to take that next and see how that links and what your proposal is to fix the housing challenge. And we have a 1.7 million housing deficit. I, I want to know about your strategy to deal with our housing issues and why we should believe you. I'll start with you, Madam Bridget Jogbenuko. Well. Um, we had a scheme which was run through uh, our Social Secu Security and National Insurance Trust, which can be revisited. We do have, you said, a 1.7 million uh, deficits, housing deficits. We have started projects that have not been finished. We must go back and finish, we will go back and finish those projects and ensure that uh, those projects and those uh, uh, houses uh, what they call low-cost housing, actually goes down to the low-cost people, people who need it. What has happened is, again, when these things have come up, there's political interference, uh, people who know people then go and purchase these houses and then go back and rent it to the people who need it. That's making the price no longer low-cost, but indeed high. We must finish the projects like that at Saglemi, for example, complete it and ensure that a scheme like the social, social security gives those who are contributing to it a, a mortgage in order for them to be able to afford housing for they, the, themselves and their families mm -hmm. at low cost. Thank you. Mr. Apasara, I would want to hear your strategy, but yes. I'll tell me why I should believe you. Our strategy is going to be finding um, land at least in areas where we can construct low housing units. And these will be assigned to workers so that they pay, and by the time they are retiring, they can own those houses. We are also going to look at building high-rise flats where you can have workers. In fact, um, if you go to the ministry, certain times after 3 o'clock you don't see anybody. Everybody is rushing out of town. But you realize that the first government of uh, President Nkrumah, they constructed high-rise uh, flats in town. That's where you can accommodate workers. And then they will have enough time to do work. So these are uh, areas that we are going to look at. And we are going to make sure that we also complete already existing programs to provide housing facilities. They also, the problem about this is the cost of those housing units that we are talking about. 
they are inaffordable. Thank we have you. to relook at the, those areas, and Thank then we will have Yaga. a solution to it. Yes. Ha. The most important thing is, hello, yes, to have high-rise housing projects for Ghanaian people, including pensioners, unemployed Ghanaians, and many Ghanaians who cannot afford to build a house. What we need to do is to cut down on cost of building materials, because most likely people are unable to build because of the high cost of building materials, which includes cement. So we reduce taxes on cement, reduce taxes on building materials, and make sure that we have digitalized lands and properties. You see, we have a problem of land in this country. People acquiring land is a problem. So we need to digitalize our lands to make sure that nobody, two people cannot own land in this country. So that we give free access to Ghanaian people who can buy land without land litigation. It's a problem. So housing has become an issue. Right now, what we need to is also to reserve land because practically people are building small, small houses. We need to build high-rise houses so we can contain people in Medina, people in Hachu, people in Nima, people in Agogoshi. When you build some high-rise houses, you can accommodate all of them and integrate them so that we make good use of land. Okay. We are losing land every day. Land doesn't grow. It reduces strengths. Thank you. Mr. Green Street. It's a very, very serious problem, particularly in the urban areas now, where more than 50% of our population now are in urban areas. And most of them are going through absolute hell by the, or the conditions they exist in. More than 50% or so of those living in urban areas are families who are staying in a kiosk, if they are lucky, maybe most even by the roadside. So we have to tackle them. Government after government have come, claimed to bring affordable housing housing, none of them do it because they are trying to make profit for themselves. His Excellency, the Vice President himself, even recently came out to say that the problem with affordable housing reflected what he called market failure. So if the market has failed, the only solution to the problem comes from government and government intervention to ensure that we have low-cost, aesthetic housing with our fantastic architects, with the right kind of resources and incentives to the industry, like tax reductions, to make it possible. Look, even recently, I happened to be having a conversation with uh, an owner of a construction company. There's technology where you can take sand, which is silica, mix it with quarry dust, which we have locally, and produce a two-bedroom flat okay. for just 100,000 Ghana cities, $15,000. It's very possible if Thank we have you. the leadership and Thank desire to do it. Thank you. Mr. Akpalu, what's your strategy and why should we believe you? Yeah, we're going to have affordable rental accommodation nationwide. We are going to build housing and we'll make sure people have places to call home. We want to eradicate these slums all around us. We don't want to see our people, our Ghanaians, our citizens, sleeping uh, in front of shops, in the markets, and the rest. So we are going to build affordable rental accommodation. Wherever you have a single room for a toilet and bath, you just rent it, you pay your monthly rent. You don't need to pay any long-term advance whatsoever. And then also going to build projects whereby our farmers, especially the cocoa farmers, can buy a house and then we give them 25 years to pay. We are going to make sure our teachers, our soldiers, our, everybody in, in this country who want to own a property can easily afford a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom flat, and then they pay in 25 years with a mortgage. Thank mm. you. Uh, yes, Mr. Hassaniaga, 30 seconds. Yes, um, you, you know what the MPP and the MDs are doing? Most of our resources that they've used to build housing projects, they increase and inflate the prices. They give to their own contractors to make money out of it, and then high-rise building becomes very expensive. Now, if you look around, you see the NDC abundance MPP housing project, MPP abundance NDC housing project. Who is losing? The state is losing resources. And they claim they are the managers of our economy. How can you manage an economy when you cannot build a house? A simple house you cannot build. And you want us to take you serious. How can we take you serious? So Ghanaians should know that they 
are only mismanaging our resources and not managing our resources. Mm, Mr. Grinkster, you have 30 seconds. Well, and you made a very important point earlier about job creation. This is one area where we, we can create vast amounts of employment because we have the resources here, whether it is the clay, whether it is the right type of architects, whether it's the right type of technology. We can create vast amounts of jobs in the building of social housing across our urban areas. We have to tackle it head on. The government have to put their investment into it because you're talking about the lives of ordinary Ghanaians, which is hell at the moment and where they're staying. And that's even the cause of the crime rates and the difficulties we have with security. All of these things are linked together and we have to tackle it head on. Mm. Okay. Gentlemen and ladies, want to take a quick break? Um, so you could, uh, you know, take a seat or, you know, um, as you may, drink some water. Um, three minutes, and we'll be back to finish up. This obviously is the Minority Political Parties and Independent Candidates debate. Tonight is the For the Minority Political Parties. It's your Imani uh, Center for Policy Education and the Joy News uh, debate live across all our networks. Joy News, Joy FM, and Love FM. We'll be back shortly in three minutes. And you are live on the Joy News channel on the multi-TV. You're also live on Joy 99.7 FM, live on Love in the uh, Kumasi. We are live on DSTV channel 142 and live on GoTV uh, 144. Um, DSTV is 4 to 1. Uh, instant and live on our many social media platforms. Hashtag is election headquarters. And shortly, you have sent us many of your questions for the uh, presidential candidates. We shortlisted just a few that will be put into them. We'll also get a very quick intervention from the audience here at the University of Professional Studies. This is the Imani Joy News Minority Political Parties debate. And thank you all for joining us. This time you could give yourselves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, in the auditorium. <laughs> Final round of questions. I will go straight to a sector that has become very crucial with the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. The pandemic has heightened the need for digitization in all facets of our lives. Now, the one critical resource for ensuring digital inclusion is internet data. Now, this will require reforms in our data pricing and regulatory regime. Now, Ghana is considered one of the most expensive countries when it comes to obtaining a license for spectrum, such as 4G technology. Now, how would you ensure that affordable data and internet access is available for every home and business. I will start with you, Madam Jubinu. Thank you. Um, indeed, uh, COVID has shown us that we do need uh, to rapidly develop our digital uh, economy. And the one way that our governments will deal with that is to um, partner with the um, telecoms industry to ensure that we spread out digital um, uh, access to most of our districts. Um, we can do this. People have asked how it is done. We have the CST tax that and um, which the CST and the, the other tax that is on the electronics. I, I, I can't quite really come up with the word. But electronics tax. That will en enable us uh, get access or send access to the, the digital technology into the districts all over Ghana. One way we can make ensure is uh, to, to make it cheaper is when there are more people accessing the technology. And of course, that would mean if we get into the districts, mm. then we are making it accessible Thank also you. to our schools who today are at home while the, the rest of the world is going on. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. David Pasara. Yes, what we need to do is to create centers where people can easily access even the um, internet. We have to have internet facilities in our public schools and in our, our communities where people can easily access them. And also, uh, we have to 
support um, service providers to have the required um, um, infrastructure that will help transmit um, um, these uh, uh, um, uh, IT uh, to these centers. So certainly we are going to partner with the um, technical bodies that will ensure that this is an easy access to the Ghanaian people. Um, certainly we would have had a better option if we had our own system, like um, we had uh, the telecommunication system, but that is out of our way. We mm. can generate one that will answer the needs of Ghanaians. Thank you very much. Data is very expensive in Ghana, Mr. Asana Erika. How yes. do you create digital inclusion? What's your proposal? Yes, um, first of all, we need to regulate the taxes on internet service providers to give them a little bit tax holidays to be able to provide internet access and to build a proper infrastructure for the internet providers. Secondly, we also need to look at boosting the internet system. Most likely in the villages where you go, there are no internet uh, links and linkages. So we need to uh, talk to all these giants in this country, reduce their taxes, promote uh, wide uh, coverage into the villages and communities and boost the system. Even as at now in, in, in Accra here, you make a call and then it tells you that the person is out of coverage area. So we need to support them, help them with digital packages for special communities so that we reduce the internet services and charges. It's very expensive. Bundle is very expensive now. And it's the most expensive in Ghana. No, sorry, in the world. Okay. So we need to cut down that. It's Thank very, you. very expensive in the world. Mr. Green Street. Well, we, we will abolish the communication service tax. Uh, we would rather there be an ad valorem tax on each mobile phone unit. Each mobile phone has a unique number. I believe it's called the IMEI number, which can be utilized to, to, to take an ad valorem tax on that, even though we will be reducing VAT itself, hopefully down from 18.5%, hopefully down to 10%. But the, the, increase or, the increase in our data charges has been caused even by government's directive for bundles not to expire. NCA has to undertake an, a very intensive a competition analysis and study. That was what was done in South Africa. And it led to a drop in their data charges by 50%. Ghana Telecom itself, if you remember, was a state-owned enterprise. Prior to selling this enterprise, we sold it off with part of our backbone as well, which has now been utilized by a company, a multinational, who don't even pay us taxes because it's claiming it's not making a profit. Mm. A greater vision should have been applied about the future, which would have been very obvious to the government about that time. And if they had thought it through carefully, they would have made a far different decision and a more nationalistic decision to protect Thank our you. future as a nation Thank in you. this key area. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul. LPG would put people's life first through technology. We are going to deploy broadband across the country nationwide. And we will make uh, Wi-Fi free in every secondary school, all teacher institutions, and as well as the basic schools. We will make sure all our libraries, li libraries, we have free Wi-Fi. So that's what we want to do. Because we believe we are in a knowledge economy, with that knowledge, you are out. So we want our people to have access to technology and to have access to knowledge and to have access to everything so that you'll be able to uh, compete with the uh, counterparts across the globe. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to end now. Um, this is a, because, of, because of time. I want to go to the last major uh, sector. And it's an important area of political unity. And then we'll go on social media also to take your questions that you've posted already. But this one, many Ghanaians clamor for a viable third force in our democracy. However, since the turn of the Fourth Republic, the cumulative votes gathered by minority political parties has not exceeded 13%. Indeed, many Ghanaians wonder if you do not know deep down your hearts that you cannot, by your individual strengths, win the 50 plus 1% of the votes required to be president. Now, this leads many to one critical question. Why won't all of you or the parties 
come together to forge a third force to topple the duopoly we have now and what is actually standing in your way? I'll start with you, Mr. Greenstreet. Well, I, I think this is a, a very difficult question to answer on the 16th of October, 40-something um, days before the December 2020 election. So I think we can have that theoretical discussion perhaps on another occasion. But at the moment, therefore, what is important is the people of Ghana who love my brother Kofi Akbalu should give him their votes. Those who love Ivor Green Street and the CPP should give me my vote. Those who love Hassan Arega and my brother Apasara and Bridget should give them their votes and prevent these two parties from getting what they want. We must give the NDC and MPP an electric shock come December 2020. They have to learn that Ghanaians are not happy with them, they're not happy with their performance, and they have to be removed. Ms. Akbalo. Audience, you're still reminded about our code of conduct. You'll get the time for clapping and cheering very soon. Ms. Akbalo. I'm 100% certain that I will win the 2020 elections. And I will win it hands down. Regardless of MPP, NDC domination, we will win 2020 elections. Because Ghanaians are fed up. And they have been waiting for the right time. And the right time is 7 December 2020. They are going out there to vote massively for Kofi Apalu and his LPG team. Madam Bridget Jokbenoko, 50 plus one, you're sure you're going to get that. Well, we are here to campaign and to ask you to give us that 50 plus one. But if not giving us that 50 plus one, it's a journey and we hope that with this, our attempt, you will hear us and know that we will be able to make a difference in the governance of our country as well as the other two. And we should be able to be the third. In fact, in 2016, we were the third party. And we will be the credible alternative to the other two uh, come December 7th, 2020. Now, what I'll say is, you ask why we won't come together. We allow divisions amongst us. We allow the two parties to interfere. And we cannot have that. But in saying so, we believe in an inclusive government, and we dare the other two parties that whoever wins should include any of us in their government and see how it runs. It's a, it's a, a, a group of ideas we are bringing together to help us get the Ghana that we want. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pasara, what's standing in your way? Yes, um, I think that um, it is quite a difficult thing. It's a human factor. Um, when political parties are there and they can't come together. And I think that if you look at even the, big, the major parties, the bigger parties, the two, what is the policy difference regarding most of the issues? It's one. But Ghana, we said, uh, when Kwame Nkrumah said one party state, we said no. And so we have a fragmentation of political parties, and that is our main issue now. But the truth about it is that a party that is so unwieldy cannot run this country well. You need a party that is not so unwieldy, and then the weight will, of the party cannot stop you from fighting corruption. The bigger the two major parties, they can't fight corruption because the party is weighty. There are numbers. Look at Britain. Look at the number of the Labour Party uh, who are Labour Party members and look at the number of people who are the, 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 the Conservatives. Not up to one million. And they are able to run. Okay. So we are going to come, uh, come this year's election, vote PNC, and you will see a difference. Thank All you. inclusive governance, and we will fight corruption without any, any consideration. Thank you very much. Ms. Ayariga. Very simple. You're part of the reason why we are not getting what we are getting. I am? The media. Okay. You give so much coverage to the NDs and the MPP. And we, the minority parties, are not giving that coverage. Look at it here. We are having minority parties. Where is the NDC? Where is the MPP? That's the point. Vote buying is another. The NDC and the MPP engage in vote buying. And they spend so much money, taxpayers' money, buying vote to win elections, not because they have better policies, not at all. They don't really have policy. They have deceitful promises. We come with policies here. We're trying to put our policies to build a sustainable economy that grows beyond corruption. Yet, we don't get the opportunity. 
you tell us we are not good enough, that we should come together. We should, yes, we want to come together. Do you give us the opportunity to come together? But I want you to know, the NDC will tell you that you're wasting your vote on Hassan Yerga, you're wasting your vote on, if you vote Hassan Yerga, you'll not win the election. Tell them, I will waste my vote on Hassan Yerga and let's see who wins the next election. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We now take uh, two quick questions from social media, and a number of you have been listening and participating on our many social media platforms, particularly on Twitter. You're going to be projecting the question, two questions on our screens, and we'll put that question to to our uh, presidential candidates in this auditorium uh, to take these questions on. The first question you see uh, on the uh, big screen is from Afes Yabon. And you see it on your screens now, if you are watching us on the Jordi channel. Uh, and what's the strategy in making our Ghana city strong against other currencies? And he's using the hashtag election headquarters. And I want to start this um, round of the question very briefly, uh, again with um, Madam Bridget Bunuku. What is the strategy in making our Ghana city strong against other uh, currencies? Well, we must produce locally and buy locally and use locally. More exports and less imports. And we must also use the government's purchasing power to strengthen our local industry. Government buys, government is the biggest buyer, and they must patronize our local industry. So when PPP is in power, that is what we intend to do. Strengthen our local industry by buying everything Ghana, and of course investing in our industry so that uh, we do the value-added uh, production here instead of exporting everything in, at its primary level. Of course, there's also the issue of jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. If you create the jobs for people to work internally, you generate uh, income internally and rely less on um, foreign exchange. Mm. Mr. Pasa, how, how, what's your plan to make the city strong? Yes, um, I had said it and I will say it again. Look. We spend so much money on finished products, and then we bring it in. And we are lucky we can stop that now. We shouldn't import finished petroleum products. The amounts of money that go into that will weaken the city, because we have to buy, purchase these things with dollars. Secondly, we have to industrialize. We have to be able to uh, mechanize our agricultural system and produce the rice that we need in Ghana. We have to engage in feed production, encourage poultry farming in Ghana, and then stop importing finished uh, or poultry products from outside. Once we are able to do all these things, our city will become stable and strong. And that is what we need to do. And that is how we will generate jobs. We don't need to buy even fabric. We can produce it here. Let's support vocational and, and technical training and set them up and let them don't wish we will create it here and then the city will be stable. Mm, Mr. Hager. Thank you. Production, production, production. Produce to consume, produce to export. When you produce enough, you don't import a lot. We spend billions of dollars importing everything in this country, including toothpick. Now, what we need to do is to regulate the forex bureaus. I don't know why it only in Ghana that we have forex bureaus. I will cancel forex bureaus in this country. We don't need them anymore. They are encouraging dollar transaction in this country. Thirdly, government must stop quoting prices or uh, 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 contracts in the dollar rate. We don't need that. We deal with cities. And we must begin to understand that everything must be valued in cities, not in the dollar. We are not in the USA. We are in Ghana. If you put dollars now on this table and you put CD, everybody will run rushing to take the dollar. We must believe in our city. We must encourage our city to perform. Today, the dollar is one city, one dollar to six cities. Where are the fundamentals? What's wrong with the fundamentals today? Mr. Are they not weak? Mr. Are they not exposing us? What is the MPP government doing? Yeah. What is Dr. Baumia? When he said that if the, if the fundamentals are wrong, the dollar will expose you. The dollar is exposing us. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, Mr. Greenstreet, uh, he says he's going to cancel forest bureaus. Uh, if you don't agree with that, what's your proposal to fix the city's 
depreciation. Why would you not have a depreciating currency or capital flight if you give Newmont 10 years um, a tax exemption? Your money will leave the country. Goldfields, your money will leave the country. Vodafone, your money will leave the country. MTN, your money will leave the country. You leave your own indigenous industrialists with nothing. We will take those tax exemptions away from those foreign companies and give it to our local businessmen. We will give them long-term loans with low interest rates to protect their industries, and we will build great Ghanaian empires and business people here. That is the way you protect your own. That is the way you break the colonial economy which we are still practicing here. That is how you get truly beyond aid, not by fanciful words that have been given by these two parties. For 28 years, they have failed. It is now time to be radical. It is now time to be nationalistic. It is now time for us to get economic independence for this nation. Mr. Uh, the strategy to uh, make the currency strong. Okay. One, we have to stop that weekly devaluation of our city. Two, we have to stop pegging or indexing our city to the dollar. And then three, we need to create local capital. We need to have our own capital by way of collective investment. I believe that if we can build a strong capital market, we'll be able to compete with everybody. And we won't be always falling on foreign direct investment because we believe that the foreigners have the money to invest here. So they'll take, they'll repatriate their returns. They will repatriate everything. And when they are going, they are going with dollar. So we need to build the local champions. And once we do that, our CD will always be strengthened. And we have to produce what we consume. We have to depend on ourselves. Thank you very much. We'll take the, sorry, next question from social media. Can I, next question. Can I add something? We, so, we yes. have to go on social media. We have to go to social media yeah, because Let, let's stay on social they've been media. listening and they have questions. Let's take it because we run out of time already. So this one from Francis Asase. He says, uh, corruption is no longer a legal issue, but of morality. Corrupt people now use the law to mass wealth for themselves, families, or friends. My question is, how do we instill morals in Ghanaians from childhood to adulthood in order to do away with corruption. Mr. Pasura, we'll start that one with you. I'll give yes. you all 30 um, seconds to answer that. I, I have said that when we win, we are going to bring back Ghana Young Pioneers. That program is very useful. The Ghanaian must be educated from infancy and build with a mind against corrupt practices. They must respect integrity and they must respect morality. If we do not have that, everybody thinks that let's get money. You cannot get money without working for it. And this is where we have to begin. Begin training the children when they are young about patriotism, about the need to be morally upright. And then you will have a society that will fight against corruption. This is where we are going to begin with. And then, as I said, so morality, mm. but corruption must be punished. Okay. Thank it must be much. punished. Thank you so much. Ms. Ayaga, 30 seconds. Corruption comes in different forms. Corrupt through information, wrong information, bribery, quoting uh, uh, outrageous figures for projects. We need to have attitudinal change. Very important. Discipline. Why are we doing this to our country? We need to punish those who are corrupt. The institutions must be strong enough to regulate and understand that people cannot just have so much when they end so less. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Green Street. Well, then we must be surrounded by a lot of fake Christians because we claim to have 70% of the population who go to church every Sunday and worship God. Bow before God, pray, give money, pay their tithes, and this is the behavior that we see in our society. Well, maybe it is a land of Anansi in which we exist. Everybody is pretending. Everybody is a hypocrite. We have to deal with the situation right at the roots, right from the early classroom, and let people understand that hard work, discipline, dedication, showing love to each other is what will take us forward as a nation. Thank you. Mr. Akpalu. Uh, this question 
to me, we've been practicing this since childhood. We've been putting the fear of God in us. But uh, my, uh, my brother Sarega said, the media has been promoting. It's like uh, when you watch the TV, you see the malam sitting there giving money from no work done, you know? And then also uh, the church, the, the priest, the pastor, will be going to the funeral and will be throwing money like something. You know, the way we do things here, when I become president, mm. all these things will stop. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. So, so we in the PPP believe in the free, compulsory, universal basic education. Whilst moral training comes from home, it also comes from school. Civic education, moral training belongs in school. And if you are given compulsory, compulsory, ensuring that the two million children outside of basic education in Ghana right now are actually enforced, the educa their education is enforced, so they remain in school. And the, the quality of the education is universal from childhood. Then you are teaching them so that by the time they are entering free SHS, as we say, if we quote a certain doctor, if your education fundamentals are weak, your SHS graduates will expose you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and uh, we scoured the audience to find a one person who may want to ask a question. We found one. And we want to give opportunity to that uh, person to ask the question. Um, you have 10 seconds. You mention your name. Straight to the question. Let's go. Thank you. My name is Francis Esau Kujo. I'm from Non-Communicable Disease Alliance. I would like to know, what will you do different for persons living with non-communicable disease, like myself, to have access to free medical care, as stated by the universal health coverage? I would like to know Thank you very what you do different. Thank I you. want to start this with Mr. Hassan Ayariga. Yes, our policy for healthcare is very simple. As you are aware, we spoke about free primary health care, affordable secondary care, and affordable tertiary care. You fall under the free primary health care. We will institute special insurance policy for every Ghanaian living in Ghana. Those who work will get DA cards. Those who do not work will have those who do not work will have public cards that the government will provide for them to have proper health care. Our issue on healthcare is about access, not just proper uh, infrastructure, access, access to medical care, access to medications, access to blood bank, access to uh, doctor nurse, nursing uh, ratio, access to consumables, access to bed, and access to everything that matters in making sure that right treatment gets to you at the right time. The most important thing is to have right treatment, right time, and then you are safe. Okay. So we will make Thank sure you. access to all kind of medical consumables get to your desk. Thank you very much. And you'll be seconds, safe. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Green Street. I, I'll allude with the answer my brother Hassan has given. And Mr. Kofi Apalu. Yeah, uh, we will provide a free medical card to unemployed and then the low uh, income earning uh, families will make sure everybody have access to quality health care. Okay. Mr. Bridget, uh, Madam Bridget Wanduku. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we need to look at the national health insurance uh, scheme again and look at how it addresses uh, people living with non-communicable diseases. But in our policy, we also believe that we must give access to people living with non-communicable diseases to have access to facilities, fitness and health facilities, uh, where we all know that with, uh, with diseases like hypertension and uh, um, diabetes, you do need uh, some kind of fitness and health uh, um, exercise regime. And therefore, we will ensure that that is accessible to people uh, uh, around uh, the country. And of course, uh, the access to uh, the personnel who will help them or who will guide them through these things. Thank you very much. Madam yes, um, we have a policy that we are going to create um, a system, an approach 
even though there is a national health insurance scheme, but it doesn't cover all this. And so many people have diseases that they can't access. We are going to give that free treatment, free medical access to everybody in the country. Whether you, 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 your health insurance can cover that or not, we are going to give that free. And that is part of government's obligation to make sure that people who live with such diseases are, are catered for. We will make sure that we strengthen our health infrastructure. We make sure that we uh, partner with private sector. We manufacture the drugs in Ghana and make sure the drugs are, are, are low mm. for everybody to get. And then I think that we will be able to provide medical um, attention or care to every Thank you very much. Ghanaian. We've come to the end of tonight's debate and we will take the closing remarks. And we start with you, Mr. Ivor Greenstreet. We have 30 seconds for us to take our closing remarks. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here this evening. I, I would plead with Ghanaians that it, it is time for them to give an electric shock to both the National Democratic Congress and the New Patrick Party. Enough is enough. After 28 years of going round and round and round in circles, the people of Ghana deserve far more. It is time for us to pursue a socialist path to development. Free SHS is a socialist policy. They praise themselves over it. We need to give jobs to our people. We need socialist policies. We need social housing for our people. We need socialist policies. That is the only way to proceed for development. Thank you. Mr. Palu. My government will create jobs, 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 and we are going to have 0% graduate unemployment. LPG government will put money directly into people's pocket. Every child in Ghana will receive 200 cities monthly child benefit. And those who are unemployed will receive 400 Ghana cities every month as unemployment benefit. LPG is all about jobs. It's all about wealth creation. A better tomorrow starts right here. Thank you very much. Madam Bridget Jogbenuku. Yes, Ghanaians. I know we all are looking for a new kind of leadership. It's been 28 years. So I'll say to the youth, look forward to your future with hope and vote for the PPP and Bridget Jogbenuku. I'll say to the women, look at a woman and know that we are also capable of changing the fortunes of this country. We are doing it in our little ways and we can do it in leadership. Choose the woman. And I'll say to the rest of you Ghanaians and everybody else, we need something new. We need a new kind of leadership. And that would be the PPP, Bridges Jogbenuku. Thank you. Mr. Afasara. I will call on Ghanaians that you have tried two political parties in the past. We are still with our troubles. And I would urge all Ghanaians to vote for PNC. Our government will come, and the thing about joblessness will be a thing of the past. Um, inability to access medical care will be a thing of the past. Inability to have education, free education from day one up to the highest level will be a thing of the past. Ghanaians' living conditions will improve and will bring a smile to every face in Ghana. Please vote that day for People's National Convention, the candidate, David Apacera. Thank you. Mr. Hassan Ayariga, your closing remarks. I want to thank you and Evans, thank Franklin Kujo for the opportunity and all those who are here for making it up here. We are grateful for the opportunity given to us. But I want you to know, we have seen the NDC, we have seen the MPP, we've seen their promises and their deceit. I stand here before you and I tell you, you might not see me in your constituency or in your house or in your village, but I speak to you from here and I ask you to make that decision that will transform Ghana and restore back hope by voting for the APC presidential candidate and the parliamentary candidate. We need to rescue Ghana from bad leadership and that bad leadership, you must be part of the APC wagon for us to change Ghana. I am grateful and thank you very much. Thank you. And this is a good time for the audience to clap as loud as you want at this point. 
as we wrap up tonight's minority political parties and independent candidates debate live on the Joy News channel, also on Joy 99.7 FM, myjoyonline.com, DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 144, and also on all our social media platforms. I am MFA Apau. And my name is Evans Mentor. And thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully, we get to host the NDC and the NPP on a night like this. Many thanks to Imani Africa and also to Joy News. Thank you so much for being a part of tonight's debate.